Am I here? Can you see me? Can you see me? Are we okay? Are we okay? And here we go. Here we go. A few years ago, a conspiracy theory about one of the world's favorite actors was posited by a Redditor in a now-deleted thread, but recently, it began to resurface. The theory being that Jim Carrey was allegedly hiding a very dark secret. Remember one of Jim's first forays into serious, dramatic acting, the number 23? Before diving into the Jim Carrey theory, we first must understand the significance of the 23 Enigma. The Titanic sank on the morning of April 15th, 1912. That's 4151912. 23. The Hiroshima bomb was dropped at 815. 8 plus 15 is 23. The Mayans said the end of the world would come in 2012. 20 plus 1 plus 2 equals 23. The 23 Enigma seems to trace back to author William S. Burroughs. Burroughs was talking with a man known as Captain Clark in Tangier, who was bragging to him that he had been sailing for 23 years without a single accident. That very day, he crashed his ship, an accident in which he and the entire crew died. Later that night, as Burroughs was mulling over the ironic tragedy, the radio show he was listening to was interrupted by a bulletin announcing the crash of an airliner in Florida, of which there were no survivors. The pilot of the plane also named Captain Clark the flight number 23, the idea becoming that once you notice it, you see 23 everywhere. Though it may seem like a strange coincidence at first, it quickly becomes hypnotic and all-encompassing, completely ruling one's perspective of reality. Jim Carrey claims to have been obsessed with the 23 Enigma long before being cast in the movie, as his production company is called JC23 Entertainment, and his father played the saxophone and worked as an accountant, just like one of his characters in the movie. In the number 23, Carrey plays Walter Sparrow, a family man whose life begins a downward spiral, when his wife gives him a copy of the number 23, a novel that contains a character named Fingerling, also played by Carrey, who is consumed by the 23 Enigma. When Walter receives the number 23 book from his wife, he immediately immediately envisions himself as the protagonist, a detective named Fingerling, and his real-world wife, Agatha, as Fingerling's girlfriend, Fabrizia. Fingerling is sent to the scene of a frantic woman known only as the <laughs> blonde, who rants about the number 23 and that it ruined her life. He then witnesses her jump to her death. Later in the movie, as Walter is desperate to find out more about the number 23, which is now seemingly ruining his life, a man attacks him with a box knife before abruptly turning it on himself, cutting his own throat. These are two of the four suicides <laughs> featured in the movie, all of which Walter, or what turns out to be his past self, Fingerling, is present for. And this is where No One and Nobody Seven's theory starts to take shape. The Twitter user theorizes Jim Carrey may actually be a serial killer, who hides his crimes by masking them as suicides. And although I don't quite buy into the theory, there are some bizarre synchronicities. The following is one of the creepiest coincidences this user points out. Actor Charles Rocket was cast on Saturday Night Live for the 1980-81 season, beating out a young Young Jim Carrey for the role. Years later, in 1994, Rocket was cast as the conniving villain in Dumb and Dumber, one of three movies that released in that one year that propelled Carrey to absolute superstardom. Take a look at this moment from the film. So what happened? So the guy tricks some sucker into picking up his tab and gets away with it got free? No. In the movie, they catch up to him half mile down the road and slit his throat. <laughs> Who is a good one? <laughs> It's important to point out that this line is not in the script and Jeff Daniels' reaction appears to be genuine shock. But what does this have to do with Charles Rocket? Years later, Charles Rocket walked out into a field on his property in Connecticut and took his own life in a gruesome way by slitting his own throat. No One and Nobody Seven alleges that this is one of several deaths that were ruled as self-inflicted that were actually the work of Carrie. Strange enough, during another scene in Dumb and Dumber, the characters are seen crying while watching a sentimental Pacific Bell commercial, wiping their tears with money. The young boy in the commercial is actor Jonathan Brandis, who also unfortunately committed suicide on November 12th, 2003. 11, 12, 2003. 23, 23. 
Tragically, in 2015, Carrie's girlfriend passed away and the death was ruled as a suicide. The coroner ruled that the young woman died of a lethal overdose of multiple narcotic prescription medications. Carrie's girlfriend was married but separated, and after her passing, a lawsuit by her estranged widower revealed that the medications were prescribed to Carrie under the false name Arthur King, which he then allegedly provided to her. Carrie denied any wrongdoing, and in 2016, the wrongful death lawsuit was thrown out. But the whole thing obviously plays into the theory. So, no one and nobody seven goes much deeper and further into detail although in my opinion it never really leads to a concise theory but more of a number of coincidences surrounding carrie that quickly become harder and harder to follow go ahead tell yourself it's just a number At the young age of just 18 years old, a beautiful rising star, Tammy Lynn Leppert, began exhibiting some odd, even paranoid behaviors after attending a rap party for a movie shoot. What happened next baffled all of her friends and family, and still leaves investigators baffled to this day. This is the story of Tammy Lynn Leppert's bizarre disappearance. Tammy Lynn began modeling in beauty pageants at the age of four and had won over 280 pageants throughout the 70s and early 80s. In 1983, when Tammy was 18, she began her acting career in the movie Spring Break. The producer of the movie were seemingly infatuated with Tammy's beauty, as it's said the torso featured prominently in the cover art was none other than Tammy's. When the movie shoot wrapped, the cast and crew threw a weekend-long party to celebrate. Tammy Lynn decided to cut loose and attend the party. Whatever happened at this party, Tammy Lynn was never the same. Tammy returned to her mother's Rockledge, Florida home, panicked and seemingly paranoid that someone was watching her. Tammy's mother, Linda Curtis, was a talent agent and at the time, an 11-year-old client, Wing Flanagan, was living at their house. Wing began to notice the sharp turn in Tammy's behavior and was nervous as she was like a sister to him. Whenever the phone would ring, Tammy would race to it, demanding that whoever answered say she wasn't there and that they didn't know when she'd be back. It was after witnessing one of these occasions that her mother finally confronted her, asking her what was going on. Tammy broke down and told her mom she had seen something awful, something that she wasn't supposed to see. When Linda tried to get Tammy to elaborate, she clammed up and said she couldn't tell anyone anything about it. Linda and Wing could 100% tell that something was wrong. They just didn't have a good idea of what. Tammy was a kind, outgoing, compassionate, and confident young woman, and this massive, almost overnight shift into a paranoid, erratic, desperate hermit made no sense to them. They knew something must have happened, but they did have a feeling that at least some of her new fears were delusional. People were calling for Tammy, Tammy, but that wasn't that unusual. This was the phone line Tammy could be reached at, and she was a busy professional model and now actress. At one point during this reclusive two full weeks she spent basically hiding from this unknown threat, she called Wing, the 11-year-old boy, to look out her window for her. I said, well, the neighbor's got a new van. And she said, exactly. And, you know, I was, I didn't know quite what she was getting at. And she said, the van has mirrored windows. That means that they can see us, but we can't see them. The two-week period of isolation seemed to be brought to an end when Tammy was cast as an extra in Scarface. Tammy was glowing, and her ability to light up a room even got her her first speaking role instead of just being an extra. While she was working on the movie, she stayed with family friend Walter Leibowitz. Just four days into the shoot, Walter received a call from the Scarface casting director, who informed him, Walter would need to come pick Tammy up as she had suffered some kind of breakdown. The scene that was being shot that day had been one depicting violence which required a large amount of fake blood. Tammy had apparently seen this simulated violence and began screaming and hyperventilating. When Walter arrived at the trailer she was in, he says she was still in a state of absolute panic and fear, claiming that they were going to find her and kill her. She ended up quitting the movie and going back home to Florida, but she couldn't find peace there either. She felt so unsafe that she would only eat off of Linda or Wing's plate at dinner because she was sure someone had poisoned hers. On July 1st of 1983, she walked out the front door to leave, but immediately became hyper-aware of just how many people were out in the neighborhood. And though they were just neighbors coming or going or enjoying the 
summer weather. To Tammy, there were threats. She turned to go back inside, but the door was locked. So she picked up a baseball bat off the lawn and smashed the front window out. This time, it took Linda hours to calm her down. After this incident, Linda took her daughter to a mental health facility, where she had a full mental and physical checkup. And after a 72-hour holding period, they informed Linda that there were no symptoms of a mental health crisis and no drugs or alcohol in Tammy's system. So there wasn't anything they could do. But they did observe that Tammy believed that she was in danger. Afterwards, Linda feels that Tammy did her best to project that she was okay, but still displayed nervous behaviors. One day, Tammy Lynn told her mom she was going out with a friend before getting in a car with a male. This was the last time Linda would ever see her daughter. That day, July 6th, 1983, was the last day anyone would see Tammy that we know of. The police did get in contact with the male friend that picked her up. According to him, the two went to the beach before getting in a verbal argument in which Tammy insisted he drop her off in a parking lot. She was seen being dropped off outside the old glass bank building that day in Coca Beach, Florida, which verified the friend's story. Tammy seemingly vanishing without a trace directly after. 40 years later, authorities and her family still haven't given up hope. Although there's been very few leads, there are some interesting theories. Of course, there's the theory stemming from Tammy Lynn's own beliefs, that she had seen something at that Hollywood party, something that put her life at risk, something tied to money laundering. But interestingly enough, there was an active serial killer in the area at that time, known as the Beauty Queen Killer. Christopher Wilder kidnapped and at least eight women in the early 80s, luring beautiful young models with the promise of modeling contracts or photo shoots before attacking them, making Tammy Lynn look like a prime target for the psychopath. However, according to the police, Wilder's crime spree didn't begin until 1984, months after Tammy's disappearance. Though there are rumors he killed in his home country of Australia before coming to America and had more victims in the USA, we'll never know as he was killed in a shootout with police in 1984. Tammy's mother Linda passed away in 1995, firmly believing that Tammy fell victim to a group of elite Floridians involved with the laundering of money tied to the drug trafficking trade. Her dying wish was to find out what happened to her daughter. Miscavige. David Miscavige is, is the big cheese of Scientology, and you're friends with his wife, and you see that his wife isn't there. Right. And you asked, her name is Shelly, where's Shelly? Right. This, there's this big wedding, where's Shelly, and what happened? Well, I asked innocently, uh, you know, where's Shelly, because I thought it was odd. It was being, uh, they were calling it the wedding of the century, the, mm -hmm. the church. And I said, well, where's Shelly Miscavige? And with that was a reaction of, you know, people just scattering. Well, and I, I asked the, the spokesperson at the time, Tom Davis, uh, where is Shelly? I think it's weird that she's not here. And he said, you don't have the effing rank to be asking about the leader's wife. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I did have the effing rank to ask where a human being was. In November of 2006, as actress Leah Remini arrived at the 15th century Italian castle ceremony to see fellow Scientologist Tom Cruise marry Katie Holmes, she had just one question upon seeing the infamous and secretive leader of their movement, David Miscavige. Where is Shelley? When the creator of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, died in 1986, his chosen heir, David Miscavige, took the throne and along with him, his wife, Shelley Miscavige, who had been a member of Scientology since she was 12 years old, the two meeting while serving in the religion's strangely paramilitary-esque Sea Org division. If you're unfamiliar with Scientology, it's a religion created in 1953 by science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. Though I'm sure the religion has helped many people, there have also been several high-profile allegations of abuse, poor working conditions, financial control, and worse. The parishioners of the church must pay increasingly exuberant fees for for the treatment sessions in effort to go clear, a process which is supposed to help remove trauma. Some members working their entire lives doing menial labor jobs and living on the church campuses. Scientology has become infamous over the years for allegedly utilizing extremely hostile and invasive tactics to discredit and defame any former members or investigators in fear of the public finding out what goes on within the church. The group owns over $400 million in real estate
estate in Hollywood alone, and pretty much bought a city in Florida. They even have several secretive, heavily guarded bases hidden throughout Wyoming, California, and New Mexico. When David took power, his wife was given a role, fit for who was ostensibly now the first lady of Scientology, creating the position of chairman of the board assistant, which put her in charge of all the highest ranking staffers. Except, she had little true power over her own life or any decisions made, as David was extremely controlling and quick to temper, making her role little more than his personal assistant. It seems Shelley slowly lost favor with David, as he shot down all of her projects and rumors of him having an affair with his communications expert, Loris Stuckenbrock. These rumors only multiplied by the fact that the two no longer shared a bedroom and hadn't showed any personal affection in front of anyone in years. According to defectors from the mysterious organization, Shelley maintained a desperate attempt to impress and assist David in his work, but did begin to feel and express that he was going off the rails. These same former members that were so close to Shelley claimed that in early 2006, she was showing signs of massive stress and anxiety, appearing unstable and fearful. During this time, Shelley made two decisions while David was away on a trip. In order to facilitate renovations to David's personal living space, Shelley had some of his belongings boxed up and put in storage. She then rearranged some of the staff positions at Gold Base where she was living, informing them of their new titles and duties. Both actions David must have considered completely over the line. One of the former members is quoted as saying, she puttered around for maybe a week or two. She was being very sheepish and withdrawn. It was like she knew she was in big trouble. In August of 2007, Shelley's father passed away, and she attended the funeral after being isolated for some time. According to former high-ranking Scientologist Mike Rinder, Shelley was taken to one of several Scientology facilities in the San Bernardino Mountains, a place he refers to as a very secret location, the heavily guarded headquarters of the Church of Spiritual Technology, where the church takes great care in preserving the writings of their founder for eternity. These writings are etched into stainless steel tablets, which are held in titanium containers filled with argon gas. Those containers are lined with heat shielding developed for the space shuttle program. The containers are then stored in deep underground vaults. Maintaining and protecting these facilities is considered an honor amongst the Scientologists, but defectors have also claimed that these locations are also used as de facto prisons. It's been roughly 15 years since Shelley has been seen in public. In six, when Leah began inquiring within the church about Shelley Miscavige and behaviors from senior members like Tom Cruise not being in line with the church's teachings, she was immediately sent to a church facility in the Scientology capital city, Clearwater, Florida, where she would spend a grueling 90 days in what can only be described as interrogation sessions. How long were you in Florida for? Uh, three months. Three uh -huh. months of, mm -hmm. of, of dealing with this? Mm -hmm. Three yeah. months uh -huh. every to, day for had, three months. Uh -huh. I had to write apology letters. Ninety days. Uh -huh. So you're there for ninety days. Yeah, all you're talking about is Tom Cruise. It was during my hiatus. On Holy Queens. shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm doing most of the time. I write these reports. I'm sent to um, Florida immediately. The mecca, the hub of science. Clearwater. That's right. For interrogations. <laughs> No, and I mean like interrogation. So you have to fly out there. I fly out there. I'm uh, in the room. I'm in a room, you know, with with cameras, with my person who is is armed with information, unbeknownst to me, of a stack of reports that were written on me. These are After Leah went public with her questions about Shelley's whereabouts, Scientology began going above and beyond to discredit and smear their former member. The church goes to great lengths to discredit those who speak negatively about it, including making a YouTube channel dedicated to painting Leah in as negative a light as possible that produced several high production value testimonials from various figures in Leah's life, including her father, stepmother, loose acquaintances, all the way down to a manager of a Scientologist hotel and a home inspector whom Leah met once. I had a pleasant one and I said, this is my profession. This is what I do. That is a hairline crack. That is not a, a concern. The volume went up. She got more upset. And I realized at that moment that I've, in the 10,000 inspections I've dealt with, I've probably dealt with maybe three people that I would consider to be truly, I don't know another word other than insane. In other words, they have some sort of hidden agenda, some reason that they want to communicate something and he was going to do a whole thing about where Shelley and going to put the church in just an unbelievably terrible position because it 
you know, he figured it all out because he's been in public relations his entire life and he figured it all out. There was going to be this untenable position where nobody could respond to it because it's so personal and it's so, irre it's so, um, it, the accusation is so, um, one of those things that you, it's like a do you beat your wife um, conundrum, right? The way they're framing the, the accusation that, <clears throat> that they can just go to town and make it, make it into it. She goes, I know that. I knew she wasn't missing. Credibility and integrity. Do you know she's not missing? You know that Leah Remedy truly doesn't have the rank to ask to know exactly where she is, when, and how she does her business. That just as much as she, that she um, <clears throat> feels like, um, you know, that she needs the credibility and integrity. Do you know she's not missing? You know that Leah Remedy truly doesn't have the rank to ask to know exactly where she is, when, and how she does her business. That just as much as she, that she um, <clears throat> feels like, um, you know, that she needs the, I goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know all that, but it's like this perfect thing because it, it puts him in a position. If it's the wife of the head of Scientology, it puts him in his untenable position. Why go to these great lengths to discredit one person? Instead of just urging Shelley Miscavige to make a public statement, it is my personal belief that Shelley is unable to make a statement for one of two reasons. Shelley is long dead, or Shelley is being held against her will at one of the church's many properties. In 2013, after finally leaving Scientology, actress Leah Remini filed a missing persons report with the LAPD. However, the report was quickly closed and marked as unfounded. According to the LAPD, they made contact with Shelley but refused to give any details as to her state of mind, health, or if they met with her in an environment where she would be away from her potential kidnappers in order to express the need for help. The case so quickly shut down, so either Shelley really is fine or could corruption be playing a role? In early November 2022, Leah Remini took to Twitter to provide a potentially disturbing update regarding her search for Shelley Miscavige, detailing how the captain who was in charge of the Hollywood division at the time Leah filed the missing persons report has ties to Scientology. Here's him accepting a $20,000 check from Scientology to an LAPD charity. And not only that, but Corey is now being investigated for providing confidential information to top CBS executives, which means he was allegedly selling confidential information to a television network. If he was willing to do that, it's not much of a logic leap to understand how easy it would have been to influence the LAPD's response to Leah's missing persons report. Leah also posted this picture of LAPD Lieutenant Andre Dawson, the detective in charge of her missing persons report into Shelley Miscavige, who also has connections to Scientology. Here he is speaking at Scientology's Celebrity Center at an event about human trafficking. Some theorists suggest that often when a dark theory surfaces around a celebrity and begins to get traction, the media will cover a scandal about that person in order to mask the deeper, more disturbing truth. Those same theorists claim this is one of those occasions, alleging that army hammers leak DMs, you know, the ones about cannibalism, were more than just fantasy. At the height of the pandemic in August of 2020, actor Army Hammer, known for his roles in The Lone Ranger and Call Me By Your Name, did an interview with Jimmy Kimmel, where Army commented that he had been living in and restoring an old abandoned motel with his old pal Ashton Ramsey near Joshua Tree in California. Yes. Yeah, uh, explain what's going on. This is yeah. So, so my buddy Ashton bought a motel in 29 Palms, which uh -huh. is just outside of Joshua Tree, and uh, it was like this kind of like abandoned, rundown motel. And I came back from uh, from the Cayman Islands where I was during quarantine, and I was like, dude, I got nothing to do. And he's like, well, do you want to come live with me in this abandoned motel and do construction with me? And I was like, you say no, right? Yeah, of course not. That's terrible. <laughs> I'm a movie star. It's the last thing I want to do. I'm sorry, did you think I had anything else better going on? Like, 
this. Yeah. Army and his wife, Elizabeth Chambers, had quietly separated and began the divorce process a few months prior. And as far as I can tell, he traveled from the Cayman Islands, where he was living with his family pretty much directly to the Joshua Tree area and into this abandoned hotel. Oddly enough, at least three people vanished from the Palms 29 area while Army was staying at the abandoned hotel. But why would anyone think he had anything to do with that? Well, months later in January 2021, an Instagram user named House of Effie leaked some extremely disturbing DMs between herself and Hammer from while he was still married. The DMs detailed the disturbing depths of Army's depraved fantasies. Army swiftly glossed over your average BDSM kinks. He showed an extreme amount of interest in consuming human blood, human flesh, homicide, and just overall physically harming whoever would be unlucky enough to be intimate with him. Hammer indicated that he knew a surgeon and wanted a woman to have two ribs removed in a surgical procedure so that he could barbecue and eat them. He even said he wanted to hold her beating heart in his hand and that he had eaten the heart of an animal he hunted. It wasn't just House of Effie. Several other women came forward with varying degrees of dark depraved messages from the actor. Now, knowing where the man's interests lie, Let's take a look at the disturbing amount of human remains found in and around the Joshua Tree area. In the time that Army confirmed himself that he was in the area, three people vanished, and their remains would later be found nearby. On June 16th, 2020, Erica Lloyd's family lost touch with her two days after she had left for Joshua Tree on vacation. Later that day, her car was found here, near the intersection of Highway 62 and Sheldon Road, near 29 Palms, exactly 10 miles or a 10 minute drive away from the Ramsey 29 Motel. Later that day, her family desperately kept calling her cell phone, the only thing giving them some semblance of hope as it was still on and ringing days later. Four days after her disappearance, someone picked up a mysterious male voice who said he found the phone on June 18th on Cottonwood Drive. This is Cottonwood Drive, less than a half mile from the motel where Army Hammer was living. Nine days later, on June 25th, sometime after nightfall, a local resident, 56-year-old James Escalante, left his home on Shelton Road and started riding his bicycle towards Highway 62. His girlfriend Sherry had received a call from her friend, whose car had become stuck in the sand just off Highway 62, about a mile from their house. When the car wasn't in the location James expected it to be in, he called Sherry and told her as much. She added her friend onto the call and told her to honk. James immediately heard the horn nearby and said, got it, before vanishing without a trace. On July 22, 2020, human remains were found nearly in the same area, but remained unidentified. Cynthia Bachman, the county sheriff's spokeswoman, only confirmed that a body had been found. Eric Lloyd's family had hired an old mining and caving expert to search the Joshua Tree area for their daughter, and sometime in early August he found a red bicycle, the very bicycle Escalante was riding when he vanished. This discovery led to an enhanced search of the area and two more sets of human remains were located, one roughly a quarter mile south of Amboy Road and Wilson Road, the other was not too distant from Shelton Road and Highway 62. It is believed that these remains belong to James Escalante. On January 21st, 2022, Erica Lloyd's remains were found as well, so the remains found at Amboy and Wilson do belong to a third victim. And as of now, there are at least six, but probably closer to eight mysterious death cases right in this tight little cluster. The connection between Army and the mysterious number of deaths surrounding his time in 29 Palms is only made more frightening when you find out that allegedly, the violence didn't stay a fantasy according to House of Effie. Effie, the original leaker of the cannibalistic DMs, eventually made an impact statement during a press conference, in which she details a horrific four-hour attack in which Hammer allegedly violently assaulted her repeatedly, bashed her head against the wall, and even beat the bottoms of her feet, causing extreme pain with every step she took in the following days, leaving her battered, bruised, and traumatized for life, all completely without her consent. She begged him to stop and even tried leaving, but he wouldn't let her. Hammer denied the claims, releasing a statement through his lawyer. As of September 1st, 2021. The investigation is still ongoing. Effie also made an interesting comment saying, what he and his friends have done is worse than anything I ever posted. Justice will be served. 
The string of mysterious disappearances and human remains being found began in late 2019. We know that ARMY was there in the direct vicinity for nearly three months in 2020. Is it possible there are one or more serial killers prowling the generally unprotected deserts of Joshua Tree?